looks sufficiently on to you? It looks on. Do you want to say a few words at the start? Or no, if you're happy to just go straight up, then um, I don't think I have anything to say other than okay. direct on people from the next um, Clicker is up there somewhere. Yeah, I think if you walk on stage, they'll probably turn the okay. lights down. And Let me know. Get Let me know when you like to start. There's a little speech I feel obligated as director to make to you. Your actors, for the next 90 minutes, remember, remind yourself, you are a banana. What's my motivation? Yes, you are a banana. You just answered that question. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Is there anyone who cannot hear me at all? all right. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mark Abrams. I uh, started a thing called the Ig Nobel Prize Ceremony back in 1991, and I edited a magazine called The Annals of Improbable Research. Both of those things, the Ig Nobel Prizes and the magazine, are all about things, real things, that make people laugh and then think. I'm going to begin by showing you a bunch of pictures that will give you some uh, basic idea of what this is about, a little tiny bit of history. And then we have five people or teams here, each of whom has won an Ig Nobel Prize. Each of them will tell you what they did. Um, they will try to tell you why they did it. And then we'll take a few questions, if you have questions, to ask them. And if you'd like an answer to your question, just request the answer from them. Could we start the slides, please? Or maybe I need to start the slides. Okay. And could we maybe have the lights down a little bit? All right, everybody can see that? Okay. And nobody can hear that, correct? <laughs> As I said, this is about improbable research and the Ig Nobel Prizes. This is our logo, which may be self-explanatory and may not. And it's all about, again, things that make people laugh and then think. These prizes, we give 10 of them every year, and this is the only criterion. Almost every other prize in the world that I'm aware of at least claims to be for the very best of something. Or a few prizes claim to be for the very worst of something, the worst movie or the worst dressed list or something. But with us, best and worst, that is not relevant. Good and bad, that is not relevant. Valuable or worthless, that is not relevant. The only thing that is relevant is that if you win an Ig Nobel Prize, you've done something that makes people laugh and then think. I'm going to show you very quickly pictures of several past winners. Again, 10 every year since 1991. Um, some of you here I, I know are very familiar with these, so these will be old friends you're seeing. For everybody else, these are probably things you've never encountered before. We gave a prize a number of years ago for the author of this scientific research study. The study you can see is called A Study on the Coffee Spilling Phenomenon in the Low Impulse Regime. This was an attempt to analyze the physics of what happens when you have a full cup of coffee in your hand, you hold it arm's length, 
and you walk across the stage or across the room. Your own experience tells you that something is very likely to happen. And indeed, that is exactly what happens. Um, the physics of it says that you are almost certainly going to spill that coffee. It becomes a matter of resonance. It's not a matter of you being graceful or a klutz. Well, it may be somewhat a matter, but it's mostly a matter of the physics. Now, I just kind of misled you, because that's not what this paper is about. The prize I just described we gave for an earlier paper by somebody else, a couple of physicists, who analyzed what happens when you walk with a full cup of coffee like this. These prizes get a lot of attention around the world. There was a high school student in South Korea who read about that prize, got intrigued, and then started wondering, what happens if you do that same thing, but instead of walking forward, you walk backwards? <laughs> That's what this paper is about, and he won an Ig Nobel Prize for it. And here he is <laughs> at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, beginning to demonstrate what he did. The ceremony every year happens at Harvard University in the US. Or here, too, I'm misleading you. Until the pandemic arrived, it happened every year at Harvard University in the biggest auditorium, also the biggest classroom that Harvard has. The winners would come from around the world at their own expense, because we don't have any money to fly them in. <laughs> We'd get a full audience, it was about 1,100 people, many of whom dressed up in very strange ways. Um, and a bunch of Nobel Prize winners would come every year to hand the prizes, to physically, to shake hands and hand the Ig Nobel Prize to the winners. We had to do things the last few years because of the pandemic a little differently, and I'll tell you about that in a bit. So here is a winner. Um, you may notice that there's a man to the left there who, is not wearing much clothing and is painted silver. Are you curious at all about? <laughs> he is a human spotlight. Uh, that individual is named Jim Brett, Dr. Jim Brett. He has a PhD from MIT, from the Massachusetts <laughs> Institute of Technology. Everybody has complicated lives. <laughs> Jim Brett, among other things, is an inventor, and he is one of the people who invented a thing called 3D printing, three-dimensional printing. So, <laughs> uh, the, the reason we have these human spotlights is they illuminate the proceedings. This is a patent. The inventors won a prize, an Ig Nobel Prize for this patent. It's um, a brassiere that, in an emergency, can be quickly separated into a pair of protective face masks. <laughs> one to save your life, one to save, as the inventor says, save the life of some lucky bystander. <laughs> Here is the inventor, Dr. Elena Bodnar. This was at the Ig Nobel ceremony that year. This was the first public demonstration of this. Uh, we keep the speeches really short, to about one minute. And she did her one minute speech, then she reached into her dress, pulled out her brassiere, pulled it into two pieces, held them aloft like this, and then she looked over to the side of the stage where we had all the Nobel Prize winners waiting to hand the prizes to the other Ig Nobel winners, and she said, um, could three of you come and assist me in doing this demonstration? Now keep in mind, we keep the winners secret until the moment we introduce them on stage. Even the Nobel Prize winners who hand them their prize don't know who the winners are or what they did until that moment. So here we had Dr. Bodner having taken out her bra, separated it into two pieces, and looking at them and asking for assistance. They were laughing at something that they had just learned the existence of 30 seconds before, and now they're being asked to help demonstrate which they did. <laughs> she got so much attention from this that she contracted with some factories in China to make this. And you can buy this. There are thousands of people around the world. Uh, the commercial name she came up with for it is the emergency bra. And it turned out to be um, unexpectedly useful the past <laughs> four years. Many people have reinvented it. 
The reason she invented it, I, I don't want to spend this much time going into the history of other things, but this one I thought you might want to know. She grew up in Ukraine. That's where she went to medical school. Shortly after she got out of medical school, the Chernobyl power plant melted down. And many of you are somewhat familiar with the history of that. She was one of the doctors who treated victims of the Chernobyl power plant meltdown. She and some of the other doctors have stayed in touch over the years with each other and with some of the patients. She said they discovered after a number of years that much of the really bad medical damage, somewhat unexpected to the doctors, was from the little particles in the air, the radioactive particles. People breathe them in. The stuff stayed in their lungs. And that's what really did bad stuff. She obsessed about that. And a few years later, she and her husband had a baby. And one day, she was in her apartment. And she'd been thinking all this time about, is there something that people anywhere in the world could do so that if there's that kind of unexpected, horrible thing, like power plant melts down or something else, and you can't breathe this stuff safely, is there something people could do to be a little safer for a few minutes so maybe they could get indoors, get some protection? She had this baby, her first child. And her baby was seated on the floor, picked up his mother's bra, and put it over his face. And that's where the idea for this came from. This, um, the man in black is named Daisuke Inoue. He is Japanese. He won the Ig Nobel Peace Prize about 25 years ago because he is the man who invented karaoke. <laughs> It was the Ig Nobel Peace Prize because by inventing karaoke, he invented an entirely new way for people to learn to tolerate each other. <laughs> he traveled from Japan to the United States to come to this ceremony. It was the first time he ever was in the US, or first time in North America. He was surprised to learn from everybody that karaoke had reached North America. <laughs> He gave his one minute acceptance speech. He does not speak English, but he memorized the sounds of it. And he sang a little bit. Um, and then we had several Nobel laureates come up behind him, put their arms around him, and sing a karaoke tribute to the inventor of karaoke. And the whole audience rose up. And they were screaming and weeping and cheering and singing along with him. There's video of that up on the, the web if you ever want to track that down. This uh, paper <laughs> won an Ig Nobel Physics Prize. This is a team of several scientists in Australia. The title, as you can see, is an analysis of the forces required to drag sheep over various surfaces. An analysis of the forces required to drag sheep over various surfaces. We get a lot of nominations for Ig Nobel. I'll explain briefly how it works. We are always looking for potential nominees. But mostly, people send in nominations. And in a typical year, we'll get something like 9 or 10 or 12,000 nominations every year. And we also look at older things. So it's, numerically, it's not easy to win an Ig Nobel Prize. And if you're trying, you're going to fail. This is, this is not a, a, a kind of a, a quality that you can intentionally manufacture uh, <laughs> and succeed at. Our general policy when we select a winner is we get in touch with them very quietly, and we offer them the prize. If they want to say no, that's fine. That's the end of the conversation. We never tell anybody it was offered. But happily, almost everybody we offer a prize to says yes. When we called them up, when I called, I was the one who made the call, uh, called one of the scientists. They, had, they knew about the Ig Nobel Prize. They turned out they were big followers of the Ig Nobel Prize. But they were very surprised about being offered a prize for this. <laughs> that phone call, it turned out, was the first moment any of them realized that what they'd done is funny. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stick around after this today and talk to any of the Ig Nobel Prize winners you'll meet, it turns out that's true of almost everyone who wins an Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> Typically, at the end of the ceremony, you know, everybody's happy and talking to each other. And one by one, the winners will come up to various people, and, and especially to me, and say, the other nine winners, those things are so funny. But <laughs> why did you choose us? <laughs> keep that in mind when you're hearing from them a bit later. 
This won a prize <laughs> about 30 years ago. This was the first, as far as anybody knows or that we're aware of, this was the first computer program written specifically to detect when a cat is walking on a computer keyboard. <laughs> the physics prize one year went to a team that um, analyzed what's happening here. They did a physics analysis of, you know, this is a penguin, and this is what happens when a penguin poos, at least many kinds of penguin. You can see it spits out the, well, spit is not the right word, but. Um, they analyzed how much pressure must build up inside a penguin <laughs> for this to happen. I expect you can see why they won a prize for doing that. <laughs> this is a Norwegian team did this paper. <laughs> Response behavior of Svalbard reindeer toward humans and humans disguised as polar bears. They have been, they study large animals in the far north, and they have been concerned for a long time about what's going to happen to these animals as the climate's changing and as the ice is melting earlier in the year and there's more land and less ice. And these animals, which normally don't interact very much, probably will. So that's what this was about. They're wondering what's going to happen to the reindeer <laughs> when uh, they encounter more polar bears. What are the polar bears going to do? What are the reindeer going to do? Now, if you were setting out to test that, how would you go about that? Well, this is all they could think of. <laughs> <laughs> and this is part of an Italian experiment done a number of years ago to try to figure out how, how people would be able to move and do things if they were on planets uh, and moons where the, the force of gravity is lower than it is here on Earth. So this was an attempt to, to calculate and to some extent calibrate um, whether a typical human being would be able to walk on the surface of water if the person and that water were on the moon. And what they did was rig up this complicated apparatus where they were dangling the person into a, a, a tank of water. He has swim fins on there. There's video, which I, I, I may have here, of, of how they're doing it. Let me see whether, yeah. Every year, the Ig Nobel ceremony includes a lot of stuff, including a little, we write a little opera, a mini opera, performed by opera singers and, and the Nobel laureates who are there. And uh, the opera in the most recent ceremony, which happened about two or three months ago, included a song that we wrote, and which was performed about this experiment. Uh, that's also on the web. If you want to go, our website's improbable.com, and you can see video of most of the past ceremonies. You can see these winners talking about their stuff. And, and doing things like this. And the final thing that I'll mention to you um, right now before I show you some of this year's winners is this. This is from a patent from 1965. Uh, the inventors were uh, named George and Charlotte Blonsky, a married couple. They described this as a device to assist a woman in giving birth by using centrifugal force. <laughs> The patent is beautifully written. I, I urge you to go find a copy. It's all over the web. Read the prose. Read it aloud to your children. <laughs> right. uh, and just a couple of, of words about the ceremony. There's this, first of all, the prize exists. Every year, there is a physical Ig Nobel Prize given to the winners. It's a different design every year. And it's always made from extremely cheap materials. <laughs> you see one here. Uh, this is another year. Uh, this is from a different year, and this is a whole bunch of them together in our little museum in Massachusetts. And this was taken uh, at the end of the ceremony one year. This is some of the people who were involved in the ceremony. Um, 
One or two of them are people who've won Ig Nobel Prizes. Uh, the sword swallower is up at the right. Uh, he did, um, he and the doctor teamed up and uh, did a survey of the medical history of most of the living professional sword swallowers in the world. Um, several of these people have, in fact, a whole bunch of them have Nobel Prizes. Uh, Benoit Mandelbrot is there. Some of you may be familiar with him and all sorts of other people. Um, Eight-year-old girl who is the heart of the ceremony, um, but I won't go into that here. And uh, again, during the pandemic, we couldn't really do it in a theater, so we, we did it instead just online. And you'll see a little bit about how that works. We don't have any money, as I said, but we did figure out at some point that we can give the winners cash, a lot of cash. Now, every winner gets a $10 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. Some of you are familiar with the history of money in Zimbabwe in the last few decades. If you're not, just turn to the person next to you. I'm sure they'll be happy to explain it to you and maybe to loan you a few trillion dollars or so. Um, the government official in Zimbabwe responsible for creating these $10 trillion bills, by the way, won an Ig Nobel Prize in mathematics for doing that. <laughs> this is Sanders Theater at Harvard, where the ceremony's been held for about the past 30 years. And I'm showing this to you so you can see another part of the ceremony. This is something the audience invented, I think, the second year. A lot of the people in the audience come with big stacks of paper that they bring. And they spend the night throwing paper airplanes at the stage and the people on stage spend the night throwing paper airplanes back at the audience. All right, now a quick look at a few of this year's 10 winners. I'm gonna tell you about the winners who were not able to come here today. The ones who were able to come here today will tell you themselves what they did. We gave a prize in mechanical engineering to a team based in Texas. They won for <laughs> reanimating dead spiders to use as mechanical <laughs> gripping tools. They wrote this paper describing it called necrobotics. They invented this word too, necrobotics, biotic materials as ready to use actuators. This is some detail from the paper. Okay. The head of the team, by the way, is, uh, he likes to say when asked that, he, no, he's not exactly scared of spiders, but he's not that comfortable with them. <laughs> and here are two of the team members and this is from the online presentation when they were being, being given their, uh, their prize. Um, and that's the person on the left is uh, Barry Sharpless, who has two Nobel Prizes in chemistry. So he was the one who presented the prize. This is the way we've been doing the ceremony the past four years. We're hopeful that next year we can go back to doing it in a theater with a live audience. We never do it with a dead audience, by the way. <laughs> we gave a prize in the field of public health to uh, Dr. Sungmin Park from Korea in the US. He invented what's called the Stanford toilet. That's where he's been based for several years, Stanford University. He invented the Stanford toilet, a device that uses a variety of technologies, um, including uh, urinalysis, dipstick test strip, a computer vision system um, for defecation analysis, uh, and an, an anal print sensor paired with an identification camera <laughs> and a telecommunications link to get all that data out. The purpose of it is to monitor and quickly analyze the substances that humans excrete. Now, he has a whole series of papers. This is one of them called a, a mountable toilet system for personalized health monitoring via the analysis of excreta. They're hoping to be able to identify illness in people before the people are aware that they're ill, catch it really early. Um, and he's He's well aware and, and, and not shy about facing up to the fact that there are a few issues about privacy involved. <laughs> this is some detail from one of his papers. <laughs> this is the inventor. And here he is getting his Ig Nobel Prize. We gave a prize in the field of communication to a team based in Argentina and Spain and a few other countries, but primarily in those two countries. They won their prize for studying the mental activities of people who are expert at speaking backward. <laughs> and there are a few places in the world where by long tradition now, when kids grow up, the ones who want to learn from the adults how to speak backwards. 
a sort of a game, but sort of a useful thing as well. Here's the paper about it. They wrote neurocognitive signatures of phonemic sequencing in expert backwards speakers. Do we happen to have anybody who's here tonight, who, or this afternoon, who, who is good at speaking backwards? No? Okay, I, I was going to ask if there was to have you come up and just give us a quick demonstration. But. And uh, here's part of the team uh, getting their prize. The person on the left is Esther Duflo, who has a Nobel Prize in economics. She presented the prize to them. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize this year went to a team based in California. Some of the team members are from several other countries. They won for using cadavers. Anybody need that word explained? Uh, cadavers, I mean. For using cadavers to explore whether there's an equal number of hairs <laughs> in each of a person's two nostrils. Here's their paper, the beginning of it, called Measurement and Quantification of Cadaveric Nasal Hairs. And here's much of the team receiving their prize from Eric Maskin, Nobel laureate, who had a lot of questions for them, I must say. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Nutrition Prize was awarded to a team from Japan for experiments they did to determine how electrified chopsticks and drinking straws can change the taste of food. And the primary thing that they've been able to do is take food that's really bland and make it taste salty, even though it has very little salt in it, which has perhaps some interesting health uh, implications. Uh, this is one of their papers, Augmented Gustation Using Electricity. They are trying to commercialize this, and they expect in the next year to be coming out with some products. So be on the search for that if that's something you'd like to try. This is the electrified chopsticks look much like non-electrified chopsticks. And here they are receiving their Ig Nobel Prize. Okay. In this case, the winners were in Japan, and the Nobel laureate giving their prize was in Australia, uh, Peter Doherty. And the psychology prize went to a team um, of Americans, um, uh, two of them posthumously, one is still alive. That first name may be familiar to a few people here, especially if you have a background in psychology, Stanley Milgram. Anyone familiar with that name? the Milgram experiments. This is a later experiment he did. <laughs> and I, I won't take the time to explain the famous Milgram experiment, but um, if those of you who, who know it and might be willing afterward to talk to people who want to know, if you just stand up for a second so people know who you are. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. If, if you're curious, the Milgram experiment is something you probably will want to know about. It's a, it's a very large thing in history, and it's very unexpected. So. Feel free to ask anybody about it afterward. Um, this team won a prize for experiments they did in the 1960s on a city street. In fact, it was New York City. So in a busy New York City street, experiments they did to see how many people walking by would stop and look upward when they saw strangers <laughs> looking upward. <laughs> this is an experiment you can do yourself. This is the paper they published about it called A Note on the Drawing Power of Crowds of Different Size. What they discovered was an awful lot of the people walking by will stop and look up. And here's some uh, graphical <laughs> illustration of what they found. And here's the one living member of the team being awarded his prize, and that's Francis Arnold, who has a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, presenting the prize to him. And the last thing I want to um, show you before we have the winners do their talks, um, I want to mention a prize that we gave back in the year 2000 and also something related to that that we then did. It was a prize to the authors of this paper. The authors are named Kruger and Dunning. What they describe here became pretty well known around the world as the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's because of this paper they had gotten some attention and then we gave them the Ig Nobel Prize, and they got a lot more attention because of that, I'm, I'm happy to say. The title of their paper, as you can see, is Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. 
Let me repeat that. <laughs> Unskilled and unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. We became kind of fascinated by this thing, and I mentioned that every year we write a little opera about something in science, usually, that's performed as part of the Ig Nobel ceremony. That's where the opera um, premieres. Uh, if you could leave the lights down, please. Thanks. Um, there's a song we did in an opera a few years ago. It's about the Dunning-Kruger effect, this thing that many people who are demonstrably incompetent at something don't realize they're incompetent. They don't see any difference between them and somebody who's clearly really good at it. So that's, that's the main part of the Dunning-Kruger thing. This opera, well, it's an opera, so it has a silly plot. And in this song, the main character is a professional psychologist who wants to tell everybody about the Dunning-Kruger effect. And he's just come into a pub, a bar, where everyone's a stranger to him, but he wants to explain the Dunning-Kruger effect to these strangers and to the people who work there, and you'll see them react. Okay. And if we could turn the lights down even a little bit more so we could see this, please. So lights down, thanks. Oh, can we have the screen lights down? Yeah, great. So that's, that's a taste of one of our operas, and there's a new one every year. I do hope you'll go to the website and just look up some of this stuff. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you by way of introduction, and look forward to next year, next September, we will have the 34th 
first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. <laughs> if you know or if you hear of somebody or some team that you think should be given an Ig Nobel Prize, they've done something that makes you laugh and then think, and you think what they did will have that effect on anyone anywhere, tell us about it. Please do the usual thing, tell your three friends, best friends about it, and then tell us. So maybe something will happen. Okay. So that's uh, our little introduction. And now we have five brief talks by Ig Nobel Prize winners. Four of them won their prize this year, got it presented to them just two or three months ago. And the fifth won her Ig Nobel Prize about nine or 10 years, and will be describing something else she's been working on since. Each person or team will have 10 minutes <coughs> to do the talk. And then we'll take just a very small number of questions from you to assist them in telling how the 10 minutes is progressing so they don't take longer than 10 minutes. We have a, a form of alarm clock <laughs> that was just invented by uh, Professor Andreas Selliver, uh, Sella, a, a chemistry professor at University College of London. Please take a bow. <laughs> okay, this, He has a number of professional inventions. This is his most recent. And this is the way it's going to work. Keep in mind, the winner has 10 minutes. Most of them will be showing you pictures. Most of them stand here or walk around, whatever. Um, halfway through the talk, at the five minute mark, the bananas will do this. Well, the person continues to talk to you, giving their lecture, <laughs> just as a quiet, indication that five minutes have gone by and only five minutes are left, the bananas will do this. <laughs> and the talk will continue for another five minutes. At the nine minute mark, when only one minute is left, the bananas will then help the speaker realize that it's time to finish up gracefully. They will do it by doing this. The winner will finish up the talk, give you the last thoughts that they think you ought to think. We can do a speed it up version here. <laughs> so this is the final minute. And they will simply um, come and <laughs> perhaps make the speaker aware that it, it's time to wrap up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So that's how it's going to work. Speakers, you, uh, you're all aware of how this works now? <laughs> right. Our first speaker will be Akira O'Connor. He and his team won the Ig Nobel Literature Prize this year. Come on up. Um, they won the Literature Prize for uh, studying the sensations people feel when those people repeat a single word many, 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 many times. Akira O'Connor. Thank you. Until his mic is turned on, if you would applaud many, 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 many times. And, yeah. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Right, I want you to think about whether or not you have ever been so bad at school that you had to write lines. Can I get a show of hands, please? OK, that's good. Um, missing some of the younger generation. <laughs> have you ever been uh, spelt a word wrong in an essay? and done control F to find all the instances of that word in the document. Hands up if you've done that. OK, that's, that's more people. OK. <coughs> when you've been doing that, have you ever noticed that the word seems to get a bit strange? Hands up if you've noticed strangeness. Good. All right. That was the question we were asking uh, when we were doing this research. 
Now, to give you a bit more context, I'm going to take you back 20 years. So 20 years ago, um, Chris Moulin and I, Chris Moulin is a collaborator of mine, um, he was supervising my PhD uh, back then. Um, we were researching deja vu. Deja vu being that strange sensation of familiarity that you sometimes feel at random when you know you shouldn't be feeling it. And deja vu is interesting because a lot of people have it. Can I get a show of hands if you've ever had deja vu? All right, very many of you. But um, can I get a show of hands if you've had it in the past day? A few, very few of you. Right, that's the problem with deja vu. It happens to a lot of people but it happens so infrequently that it's difficult to study in the lab. So one of the things that we tried to do was to generate it in the lab so that we could study it as it happened. And we tried all sorts of things. We tried things like uh, subliminal presentation of, um, of stimuli, and representing those stimuli consciously to see if people kind of ooh, weirdly recognize them. Uh, we tried post-hypnotic amnesia, so I hypnotized them, uh, showed them some stuff, and then out of hypnosis, presented that stuff to them again, and they thought it was a very strange experiment that generated feelings that were kind of like deja vu, but not really. So, kind of taking stock of all of these failed experiments, um, we concluded that generating deja vu was hard. <laughs> we also thought about other sensations that we could try and generate that were in the kind of same family of sensations. And another one of those sensations is, well, one is jamais vu, another is presque vu. If, either, if any of you have, uh, have read Joseph Heller's Catch-22, uh, he writes about these sensations um, in, at a couple of places in the novel. Um, but they're dissociative sensations. The thing about these sensations is that you get a dissociation between what you feel about your memory and what you know to be true about your memory. So in deja vu, you get a sensation of familiarity, uh, but you know that that doesn't align with what you know to be true about your own, your own memory. Jamais vu is the opposite sensation. It's a dissociation between novelty and what you know to be true about your memory. You feel that something is, is new about the stimulus you're looking at, but you know that it shouldn't be new, especially if you've been writing that stimulus over and over and over, which is what gets us back to that sensation of semantic satiation, what you all described or what many of you described as having experienced um, by either writing lines, particularly if you're writing the words down the page rather than across page. So you get bored of writing a full sentence and you just say, I, 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 will, 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 not, 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 and so on. So Chris and I noticed that this sensation that we had experienced when writing lines was a dissociation between novelty and what we knew to be true about our memories. This word seemed new, but it wasn't. But we were two psychologists who were intensely interested in kind of phenomenology of memory. And we needed to do some experiments to see if other people would notice these things. And unfortunately, we didn't have a convenient audience of nearly 500, 500 who would stick their hands up if they'd experienced anything like this. So, <laughs> we got 90 people into a laboratory and we had them write out 12 words, one at a time, and we told them to stop as soon as anything, anything felt strange about those words, and we got them to tell us why. And of our 90 people, about 70% of those people stopped at least once and said, told us that the word felt strange. Of these people, um, it, was, it took about 30, 30 repetitions of the word, or a minute's writing to do this. Now, one of the additional things that we noticed as part of this 
was that we'd bro broken our words up into high frequency, medium frequency, low frequency words. It's what psychologists do when they're struggling to think of any credible manipulations to put into their, <laughs> their, their studies. And we found uh, that medium and high frequency words led to more incidences of this kind of semantic satiation, this, this thing that we think is an analog of jamais vu. So, thinking that we would need another experiment, we were a little lazy, and we asked people just to write one word out. This word being what we thought was the most frequent word in the English language, the. And um, people experienced exactly the same thing, but in one twelfth of the time. So it was a very straightforward way to get a two experiment paper to try and publish. And try and publish we did. Um, and when it was accepted, um, at, the, uh, at the stage of finaling, finalizing our manuscript, Chris decided that we, it would be an excellent idea to demonstrate the phenomenon in the title, the title of the paper being The, 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 The Induction of Jamais Vu in the Laboratory. <laughs> and that caused some problems with the typesetters and so on, but we got there in the end. Now, why did we do this? This is going to seem a little tangential, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke had some rules. Um, there are kind of three rules that people talk about. People only really talk about the third rule because the first two are kind of ageist. But the third rule was any technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And you can think about this in terms of your, your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is a kind of gateway to knowledge. It's a gateway to uh, personal Messaging, it's a gateway to all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, human pleasures. But if you were to show that to someone who had never seen a mobile phone before, they would think, what on earth is that? It's incredible. How, how does that thing work? It's just, it's just a vision of the future. Until you point out that, yeah, the, the screen is cracked or until you point out that, yeah, the battery doesn't last long. It's kind of, it, it's always like turning off when I need it the most. And it's that really lovely thing about magic. Magic only appears to be magic when it's working kind of really well. As soon as a magician lets up in their magic, you start to see how the trick is done. And that's what we were trying to do with consciousness and with the conscious awareness of memory. What we were doing was attempting to spot all of these points in human conscious experience where your sensations kind of break. They, they kind of, um, they, f <laughs> they, they fall away from your own experience, your own knowledge of memory. And it's by studying these, these breaks that you start to see how the bigger magic machine works. So we aren't clinicians like <laughs> Oliver Sacks. Um, we don't have regular access to neuropsych patients, so instead we just have to be observant. We notice the subtle moments <laughs> when consciousness breaks, and we use these moments to understand how consciousness, our minds, work works like magic. <laughs> we have time for three or four questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Choose whoever you like. Um, we've got a question down the front. And, and we'll get a microphone to you. In, in the middle, uh, if you could raise your hand again, yes, please. The strange feeling that people had after writing a word many times, I mean, I found that 
if I write a word too many times, the spelling no longer seems right? Is that the sort of feeling that you're talking about, or was it something more? That's exactly right. It, it's, it, people express this kind of feeling of novelty in all sorts of different ways, but that's one of the most, uh, one of the most common experiences, uh, th that it, the spelling starts to look wrong, you start to get doubts about the spelling. But that feeling can go to, to extremes, where we had one of our participants tell us um, that it looked like uh, the word was a fake word and someone had convinced them that it was a real word. And also, um, and Mark will know about this, wasn't there a few years ago a lady who came by to talk about the difficulties of indexing things with the word the in them? Yes. So she must be having nightmares now. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, I think Akira is familiar with this now. We gave the Ig Nobel Literature Prize also to uh, a woman named Glenda Brown, who lives in Australia. She is a professional indexer. The index is at the ends of books and things. That's what she does. And she wrote a long report about the difficulties caused by that word the, the difficulties for people who are professional indexers. <laughs> Another question? Choose anybody near you. <laughs> Does the feeling also translate to typing or speaking? Yes, yes, uh, it does. Um, so there's a uh, there's a, a scene in Ted Lasso where uh, the Ted Lasso character is saying the word plan over and over and, and saying it. Yes, he he reports um, a fictionalized experience of of jamais vu. Um, it also interestingly works. Um, receptively as well. So not just when you're producing, when you're, you're writing or saying the word, but if that word is being said to you um, or, or you're seeing it flashed on a computer screen as, as in the kind of find and replace thing, it works in the same way too, yeah. Okay, and one final question. Raise your hand if you would like to ask it. Your choice. Uh, was there something that got people back on track? to be able to get, you know, make the word seem reasonable again. Yeah, so, so usually it, it's just time, time away, a brief separation, a trial separation that leads to happiness again. That's, that's the <laughs> ideal, um, and uh, th that tends to be what happens as well with, uh, with Shami Fu. Okay. Thank you, Akira O'Connor. The next talk will be by several members of the team. And team, if you could come up here and got to get your microphone on one of you. The team won the Ig Nobel Physics Prize this year for measuring the extent to which ocean water mixing is affected by the sexual activity of anchovies. <laughs> Please welcome Pieto Fernandez Castro, Miguel Gilcoto, Esperanza Brulon, and Beatriz Morno Cabalido. Hello, thank you everyone for uh, being here. Thank you, Mark, for giving us this opportunity to tell in front of so many people that we are oceanographers, not sexologists. <laughs> uh, so we are only concerned about animal sex as a hobby, not as our job. So <laughs> if you have questions about your dog being pregnant, it's not us. Uh, so what we like, we are oceanographers, we like water, we like the ocean. And the ocean, because there are winds and tides, is, uh, it looks very much like that. It's a very turbulent place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really shaky, it's a shaky place. And uh, turbulence in the ocean is, I, I find a really fascinating phenomenon because it happens at very small scales of a few meters, but it's able to uh, do things that have a global impact, like transferring heat around the ocean, helping up to maintain a global circulation. It's also very important for marine life. So life uh, needs basically two things. So every life on Earth, almost every life on Earth, 
relies on photosynthesis and photosynthesis needs light and needs nutrients. But those two things in the ocean are in completely separate places. So light is at the surface. The sun bring us, brings light, light to the ocean surface. But nutrients are at depth. So by having turbulence in the ocean, we are able to mix these nutrients upwards so they can be eaten or utilized by phytoplankton and then we have a flourishing marine ecosystem. And because we like turbulence so much, uh, somehow the thing spun up out of control and we started measuring turbulence like crazy. And that's something we do very often. Uh, so that's where the story about anchovy sex started in this uh, field campaign, uh, close to where I used to live, close to where they live, close to where Espe is from, the famous town of Buell. If you haven't been there, you should. It's very pretty. Uh, so we uh, were in a field trip there, very close to home, because we were trying to shed light on some very important problem. So this is a picture of uh, the area. This is the big old uh, city. And you see these sort of squares there. Those are mussel rafts. So we grow mussel there. So it's a very important uh, uh, economic sector. But these cultures are threatened by um, the regular appearance of harmful algal blooms, so what is popularly known as, rec as red tides. We think the mixing of the water and turbulence in the water is related to the occurrence of this. <laughs> you are not mixing properly, no. you are only... <laughs> okay. So we went there for 15 days and we were measuring turbulence all the time. Uh, we're using this profiler that measures very small scale fluctuations of velocity and temperature in the water, and that uh, gives us information about turbulence. So we're basically profiling up and down with this guy for 15 days. Okay, this is the only uh, colorful plot I'm going to show in this presentation. This is a time series for five days as a function of depth and time of the intensity of uh, turbulence in the water. So it's dark at the surface where we have wind, and it's pretty yellow below, so that means that the turbulence is very weak there. But every night, we find these stripes, black stripes, appearing, very, very strong turbulence. This is what, same as we have at the surface, with, the wind was not super strong, but it was significant. So it's very strong turbulence for these deep layers at 20 meters or so. We didn't know what it was. The, the place where we were was quite sheltered, the tide there is very weak, there was nothing physical that could explain that. But someone had left the TV on, on the ship. And every time we were measuring stroke turbulence, the TV was showing this, all these red dots and all these dirty red things. Uh, the TV was not a TV, it's the screen from the echo sounder. So the echo sounder is an instrument that sends some sound into the water, and the echo of this sound tells you about the presence of fish or someone that is down there in the water. We thought it could be fish, maybe, I don't know. Something that is usually in the water. Uh, so we thought, okay, that could be fish. That's unusual, but it's the only thing we could plausibly think is going on there. And we didn't have any fishing nets. So, I mean, what scientists would do is, oh, there is fish there, we tried to catch them, but we didn't. And we were not equipped for that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look very much like the bongos. So we have these, uh, these instruments that look very much like these bananas. Uh, <laughs> that's very timely, thank you. And um, they, they are designed to capture phytoplankton, so tiny cells, uh, a few microns. Uh, so not really designed to get fish, but it was the only thing we had, so we thought, oh, okay, we may just throw that and see what comes up. Um, we didn't look at the samples until the, the almost week before we were planning to, planning to submit the paper. <laughs> we forgot about them, and then, uh, but in the end we said, oh, we should look at that maybe. And they were full of eggs, thousands and thousands of eggs belonging to anchovies. <laughs> uh, so that's how we concluded that the very strong turbulence that we're seeing was caused by anchovies that were obviously having some sexual activity and producing thousands and thousands of eggs. And that's also why we came to the conclusion that the earth moves when fish have sex, if you didn't know it. Thanks to us, now you know it. 
Um, okay, that's something, it's not really new. Um, the idea that maybe animals living in the water can have some effect in ocean mixing. Walter Mank is the, probably the most famous physical oceanographer. He uh, put forward this idea that the global scale circulation of the ocean is really linked to these small scale processes. Uh, but he couldn't tie up the numbers. So when he was looking at how much energy is mixing in the ocean, there was not enough. So he thought, oh, maybe, uh, maybe it's fish. So he realized that there is some, as much energy going into the marine ecosystem as you would need to really mix and provide enough mixing to contribute to the global circulation. This was in the 60s. Then people tried to look after this phenomenon, tried to sample it uh, really, really hard. Uh, most of the people fail. So that's when someone asks me about what is the next step uh, about this research, I tell them I wouldn't recommend anyone to do any research in biological mixing because if you get money for doing it, you will find some, and nothing. Um, some people have observed in strong turbulence in the presence of fish, but turbulence doesn't mean mixing. So that's the key problem. So you can shake things up in the water, but that doesn't mean that you are able to mix different layers of water. And that's, uh, that's explained here in this diagram. So basically in the ocean you have waters of different temperatures, different densities, over large depths of hundreds and thousands of meters. So temperature and air property change very slowly in the ocean. So if you have a small little fish, and this is representing sort of temperature, right? It's uh, getting warmer towards the bottom, maybe that's not very good, but uh, <laughs> I realize that now. <laughs> we should send a corrigendum to this paper. Um, but the point here is that the layers are very far apart. So a very small fish will maybe shake up the layers a bit, but nothing relevant will happen. But what we found during our, our observations is that the, the, the water column, as we call it, had ve those layers very close together. So we were able to measure with our instrument uh, these layers becoming steer with each other and mixed. Uh, so that, that makes this turbulence really relevant. And it's the first time that someone has ever observed that. Uh, so that's why our study is, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think it's important, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we managed to publish it somewhere. So it's like <laughs> and uh, I think these guys are going to disrupt my talk. Can you do something about it? <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, final word, I mean, uh, as um, anything in oceanography, this was a team effort. We are, yeah, <laughs> many people involved in this research. Uh, someone has to run the ship, someone has to uh, cook and provide food for the scientists because we are unable to do that. Uh, <laughs> we have technicians and people with different expertise. We have people counting eggs, people measuring turbulence. Uh, uh, people making sure that uh, nothing went out of control, so, yeah. Thank you everyone here and everyone that was there involved. <laughs> I was too short. If you have a question, raise your hand. A question there. I'm going to pass the I, questions to you. Does this mean, hello? Does this mean that, because um, for the atmosphere you just need a butterfly to flap its wings, does this mean for oceans you actually need a little bit more then? Uh, Sorry, I didn't uh, get the panel. For, for, for the atmosphere to get an effect across, you know, this the classic thing of a butterfly flaps its wings yes. and it causes uh, um, like a tornado on the other side of the planet. Are you saying that you actually need fish to have sex in the oceans for this effect <laughs> to occur? Yeah, so I mean, I still, so the effect is, I think it doesn't sort of propagate to larger scales in the same sense. So we are still really close to scales where dissipation happens. So the fish will introduce some energy in the water and molecular friction will eventually kick in and dump the thing down. But by doing that, you also have some mixing of the water column. We will change the density structure, we'll flush nutrients upwards maybe. So I think it's a different large scale impact from what we understand as the butterfly effect, 
which is probably a large, even though you know we picture it as a butterfly, as a butterfly, but I think it's a larger, slightly larger scale problem. I think maybe the question you were asking yeah. was, is sex necessary? Do <laughs> <laughs> you want, want to speak a word or two about that? I think one word is enough. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Next question. Raise your arm, please. I'm curious a bit about the timing uh, and the time span that this is occurring. You said that you were observing this at night. So, and I'm also curious about what time of year. Is this like a seasonal pattern? Um, and how does this fit into possible other aspects of this ecosystem? Is this perhaps something that is occurring seasonally that is also integral to other parts of the ecosystem? Well, pass this on to Bea because I think she will enjoy her plan. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, that happens at night, usually with many species, because they get together at night for, for sexual activity and to put the eggs. So it happens during the summer, because the temperature is warmer. But we really don't know about the special scale of the, of the event. We really don't know yet. Okay. And one final question. Um, just a quick, quick question about, um, you, you know how melting fresh water in the, uh, in the Arctic potentially has, uh, can stop the Gulf Stream, can, can slow down the, slow down AMOC, but can, and as we all know, anchovies are pretty salty, so if we put loads and loads and loads of anchovies into the North Atlantic, <laughs> could that potentially reinforce AMOC and then reverse the damage done by climate change? <laughs> This is for you, this is for you. <laughs> well, well, that's a good point, you know. <laughs> Perhaps we need more anchovies to fight the uh, climate change, I think, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. The next talk will be by a member of the team which won this year's Ig Nobel Prize in the field of education. They were awarded the prize for methodically studying the boredom of teachers and students. Okay. Is that coming along OK? Please welcome Wynand Van Tilburg. Uh, hello, everyone. So as you, as you know now, my name is Wijnand van Tilburg, and I'm a boredom scientist. Uh, we exist. Uh, we're, we're increasing in numbers rapidly. Uh, hopefully, as you will see, because boredom is a surprisingly interesting topic, I think. Now, the reason why I became a boredom scientist um, is, uh, is a bit obscure. Um, there's not much research from boredom. And in order to explain how we apply this to education and why we apply this to education, I need to give you a little bit of background of how boredom research has progressed. It's a very new topic. Uh, but before us, there were lots of philosophers who talked about boredom. According to Sartre, boredom is a leprosy of the soul. Whatever that means. <laughs> Kierkegaard described boredom as the root of all evil. In fact, Kierkegaard speculated that one reason why humans might exist is because the gods were bored. Uh, he also suggested that the, the original sin might have been caused by boredom. Of course, if you want to go really negative, you just look at Schopenhauer, uh, who always has something nasty to say about anything. According to Schopenhauer, the fact that you can be bored is evidence that life is ultimately utterly meaningless. But think about it. If you have everything you want, you've achieved all your goals, are you going to be happy? No. You're going to be bored. <laughs> now, like these three gentlemen, I also went through a short goth period. <laughs> <clears throat> and at that point, I got really, really interested in boredom. So, as a psychologist, 
how do you study boredom? Well, you might know from, if you know Milgram's experiment in particular, uh, the old one, that psychologists can be a bit sadistic when they do their research. So as an experimental psychology, me and my colleagues developed all kinds of ways to manipulate and to study boredom in the lab. One way is by giving people the task to draw lots and lots and lots of spirals. Is there anyone among you who's familiar with writing reference sections? <laughs> right? So we had a good colleague who came up with a brilliant idea. He said the most boring thing he has to do in his daily life is to write reference, settings, uh, reference lists according to some sort of uh, standard. In, in psychology, we use the all extremely boring APA style. Inspired by this, um, we develop manipulations where we give our students references to copy. Uh, we don't give them just any reference. We tend to give them references on topics like lawnmowers um, <laughs> and concrete mixtures. <laughs> now, I've learned that probably we should also ask people to, to copy uh, the word the. That might also work. I think, <laughs> I think we're getting some inspiration here. Uh, how else do we manipulate boredom? Well, for example, if we want to study the effects of boredom, what we do is we, uh, we let people watch videos. <laughs> a uh, very, very effective way to manipulate boredom is by having uh, people watch washing machines <laughs> for long periods. <laughs> um, now, before I turn to why boredom in education is important and why we investigated this, let me tell you what we have found before we decided to start this research in educational studies. First of all, we've basically confirmed these philosophers' uh, perceptions. People who are momentarily bored feel that their life in the moment is meaningless. If you're bored for a long time, you're going to be more likely to become depressed, anxious, you might develop an eating disorder, you're going to be dangerous in driving, and all kinds of things. We know from studies and experiments on boredom that if you're bored, you're more likely to be aggressive. Another team of researchers has found, for example, in lab experiments, that people who are made to be bored are more likely to shred worms in a shredder. <laughs> it was not conducted in the UK, that study. <laughs> um, uh, so aggression, also intergroup aggression, being hostile towards outsiders, people from different nationalities, boredom causes it. Boredom causes gambling behavior and problems, uh, substance abuse, and just as a warning to the banana sitting there, we found that with each standard deviation of daily boredom, people eat on average the same quantity of calories that one banana contains. <laughs> Uh, more recently, we have found that boredom even... Oh, there you come. <laughs> I think you should watch out a little bit. <laughs> we have even found that inducing boredom in the lab using our washing machine, um, compared to a nature documentary, increased men's sexual arousal, <laughs> um, measured with a tiny lasso. So, why is this interesting, and why have we then investigated um, educational settings? Well, it's a bit personal, and, and also beyond that, but definitely also personal. I teach, um, aside from my research, and I teach statistics to psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies to those of you who study statistics or mathematics, uh, you know, <laughs> for, for, well, on purpose, psychologists, <laughs> psychologists detest, psychology students, I must say, detest statistics. Um, and a classroom like this, with slightly less wealthy uh, students than, than these uh, well-dressed people, are not very uncommon. Um, and now that we know all these nasty consequences that boredom might have, we thought it would be about time to actually figure out how our own students are affected by this. Um, and we did that in two papers, uh, one of which I'm on, the other one is from my co-authors. And in the first one, what we were interested in in particular was whether the mere anticipation 
of being bored in a lecture is enough to make you actually bored. Now, consider this in the context of those poor psychology students going to their lecture on, uh, on T-TETs or ANOVAs or regression or something like that, without having ever been taught that topic, they probably anticipate being bored. And we wondered if that anticipation is enough to make them bored indeed. So how did we test this? Um, we, in one study of the three studies we did on this, we ran an experiment where we just asked people to evaluate or to see how bored they got watching an online lecture. Mind you, this was done during the pandemic, so most of this was online. And we gave them a video from a Yale lecture on literature that you can find yourself. I have not watched it. <laughs> <laughs> because I do find statistics more interesting. <laughs> the only thing we did was change the labels given to these videos. Either the video was described as voted most boring in 2015 by Yale students. And Yale students know, of course. <laughs> we had a, a control condition where we didn't give any anticipation. We just left it like that. And then we had a third condition where we did the opposite. We described it as the most interesting lecture as evaluated by Yale students. And what we find is that whenever it's described as more boring, you find indeed students say that they're utterly bored by it. They're wrong. It's the same content, but just the anticipation is enough. In another paper uh, uh, that, that was authored by my colleagues, they investigated educational boredom in a different way. They wondered whether the boredom by a lecturer themselves or teachers in high schools themselves might transfer to students. And what they did was, over a long period of time, they uh, ran a diary study where they kept people's entries um, on how bored they were during class settings. And they found that as the teachers themselves became bored with the topic, so did the students. But the interesting thing was that the students didn't necessarily know that the teachers were bored. So you get these effects even without realizing that the person who is teaching you is just as bored as you are. <laughs> Takeaway, first of all, if you're boring as a person, as a teacher, your students obviously will be bored. If you're bored yourself, it's likely that your students will also be bored. If students think that you're going to be boring, they will also be bored. So there's no escape, it seems. <laughs> students will probably always be bored. <laughs> I want to thank my collaborators, especially Katie Tan and Christian Chan, who are the lead of most of this research, uh, and also our various collaborators on these products, projects. <laughs> right. oh. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, I was curious, the one where if the teacher was boring, it was correlated with the students. Was there any way of isolating whether it was just the subject matter at that given time was, was boring? So, uh, yeah, that's a good point. In, in these cases, what we have done is looked, or what they have done, has looked within the same subject topic, right? So that's, that's essentially controlled for, yeah. Uh, and the, the speculation is that there may be nonverbal cues that somehow, you know, without students being aware, uh, trans transfer some of this boredom, right? So they're not able to recognize it in others, but still we'll find this. Yeah. Okay. And final question. Um, in the experiment where, where you, you know, labeled the same lecture as different amounts of boring, how large was the sample size? Uh, that, is a, that is a fairly detailed question about a paper that was published, I think, two years ago. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't enormous. It would probably have been in a range of 120 or so. Yeah, which is, it's a series of three studies, so that's fairly small. Uh, uh, typically, that's the range of, of participants that we have. If you want the exact detail, I can, I can look it up for you. <laughs> um, but, but just, uh, just as a side note, you know, this is a series of one of three studies. Uh, and across those three studies, you'd be fairly confident. Okay. Why not Von Tilburg? Only two lectures left. Our next lecture is from the person who won the Ig Nobel Prize jointly in the fields of chemistry and geology. He won his Ig Nobel Prize for explaining why many scientists like to lick rocks. <laughs> Please welcome Jan Zolasowicz. Oh, I shall need one of these. Okay. There it is. Yes, so uh, why do scientists, oh, geologists, I have to say geologists, I'm a geologist, uh, and I lick rocks all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not just because, you know, one of the, 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 the key transferable skill in geology uh, is to be embarrassment proof. <laughs> There are so many things that one has to do in the field. Uh, but licking rocks is one of the most sensible of them uh, in, in there. And uh, 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 one licks a rock because, I mean, here's one of the examples. You get the field lens, you get the field hat. <laughs> see, embarrassment proof, you see. Yes, yes, uh, and this is very, very appropriate. You know, the first day in the field with students, you know, I take this. Uh, and the students laugh like a drain. The second day, they think. <laughs> they say, Jan, can I borrow your hat? <laughs> so you take um, licking rocks like that is uh, simply because they look better. You take a rock like this, and you don't really know what's going on. And you give it a lick, and then everything becomes a little bit more clear. So let's, let's uh, if this machine will work, uh, there it is. Here we have um, uh, 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 a very nice rock. It's a beautiful rock. Uh, there's the wet bit on, on that side. And you can see you know, things stand out quite clearly. There's a dry bit. And it's much harder to work out. Um, uh, we didn't actually lick all of that rock, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Buckets did the note job very nicely for us. Uh, but that shows how it, uh, it, it, uh, the, the basic trick works. And it's so useful. You, you just don't think about it. You pick up a lock, lick, hand lens, and there it is. Uh, and it's, it's kind of wide. It's all, all kinds of things. Fossils as well. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, a mainly a paleontologist by trade. Uh, and this is um, uh, 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 it's a nice one. It's, a, uh, it's called a graptolite. Uh, here's another one like, like this. Um, there's the dry one on there. Uh, and there's the, um, the, the wet one, where you can see much more detail. Um, here we do, you know, even more strangely, uh, for wetting a graptolite, we use alcohol. Um, isopropyl alcohol, I'm afraid, because it just has the right kind of uh, uh, optical uh, properties. Uh, but that's, it's, it's it. Dead simple like that. Uh, the other thing about these is that these creatures were macrozooplankton 400 million years ago, before anchovies. 
So, <laughs> there's the next research project for somebody uh, on that. So, licking rocks. Uh, some days you don't have to lick rocks at all in the field. <laughs> the weather does it for you. Um, uh, other days, of course, in, in the field, you know, uh, licking a rock is, is, is uh, you know, something you would do. Uh, you might uh, hallucinate a little bit after that, but that's just <laughs> part of the dangers of the job. <laughs> um, and here's something else that came out, you know, that, and I only uh, found this out, you know, after the IG of this year was, was announced, uh, uh, that some paleontologists uh, uh, use licking to tell dinosaur bone apart from rock because it stink, sticks to the tongue better. You know, so there is you know, the, the, uh, uh, the new very important fact you know, of, of the day. Um, but really, uh, I mean, we are now modern geologists. We have all kinds of posh stuff uh, to help us identify rocks and, and uh, textbook. But this is Meet Giovanni Arduino. Uh, he was a, a, an Italian savant. There was really no geology there. Uh, then in those times, or, or chemistry, uh, in, in the mid to late 18th century. Uh, and he made his living by knowing what rocks were and what rocks you could use and sell and get minerals from. Um, and uh, some of his letters were translated re recently, um, just in the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, and it was clear, they're beautiful letters, absolutely beautiful, to a, uh, uh, you know, a, a posh professor friend of his. Um, and it was clear he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, you know, or his feet. He got everywhere in, in the field. Uh, and this is why he's famous. You know, he got a, a sequence of rocks together in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Apennines, uh, and that is what became the geological time scale, you know, um, uh, eventually. So he first worked out how rocks and time were uh, associated. He may well have eaten some ba bananas to give him energy as he did this. Um, uh, and what he did, he had no textbooks, no machines, so he used his eyes, he used his sense of touch, and his sense of taste in that. So if you have a Shelley mudstone, for instance, and you burn it, then it'll have a very particular kind of astringent flavor that he could recognize. Uh, and if you've got, there's a beautiful mineral, marcasite. Again, you know, when that was boiled in water, that had a particular flavor, so we could recognize mineral, that mineral uh, and identify it. You know, so there it is, the beginnings, if you like, of, of geochemistry, uh, of, of, of licking rocks for a real purpose. Which might take us to eating rocks, or more rather eating fossils. Um, uh, and again, this isn't often done, but there was one beautiful, <laughs> legendary occasion in 1951 in the Explorers Club uh, in New York where the menu had mammoth. It had frozen mammoth um, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought in from the, 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 the permafrost of Alaska uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the intrepid uh, guests ate the mammoth. Uh, except for one guest who wasn't quite as intrepid as the others and left a bit of it. Uh, and that was put in a museum in, in, uh, uh, and, and preserved. Uh, and then some students came along a few years ago and did some DNA tests on it. And alas, uh, it was <laughs> mock mammoth, but real turtle that they were eating all the time. So, um, uh, it just goes to show, you can't always believe the rocks that you eat. <laughs> uh, but this one you can, uh, and this is a, 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 a real-life example, uh, which really did happen. Uh, meet Blue Babe. Blue Babe is a bison, um, uh, uh, known to be now at least 50,000 years old, pulled out again from Alaska, from the permafrost, uh, and here it is being prepared for uh, uh, being put, being stuffed and, and, and put on stage. Uh, but when it was being prepared, some meat from the neck was taken out uh, and given the works. Boiled up with veg, herbs, 
peas, carrots, goodness knows what. Um, and uh, the people in, involved in the team had a ceremony dinner and ate it. Uh, apparently, it had a, an earthy Pleistocene aroma, uh, this thing. <laughs> uh, unlike the horror films, they all survived, you know, the, the experience uh, in there. Uh, and, uh, but it's a rare experience. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, an even rarer one from uh, about uh, uh, almost exactly a century before, uh, where a whole host of the great and the good you know, of Victorian uh, early savants, early geologists got together uh, and ate not a dinosaur, but they ate within a dinosaur. Uh, so this is uh, the model of, of uh, an iguanodon. Uh, all wrong, of course, all wrong. But life-size, life-size, uh, in the Crystal Palace, that was the exhibition uh, of 1853. Uh, so they gathered together uh, and they had a meal inside the iguanodon. Uh, 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 and uh, a good ha time was had by all, and it became one of the famous uh, geological meals. Um, the big question, of course, is did they eat bananas for dessert <laughs> uh, in that? Uh, so with that, uh, I will leave you all. Um, enjoy the next rock that you find. Bon appétit. <laughs>
Do you have a personal favorite? Yes. Yes, yes, quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you yeah the seaweed helps as well, of course. Did you want to invite a couple of people to... Uh... Oh, yes, yes. If, if you would, you know, please, if anybody would like. I have a selection yeah. of rocks here. <laughs> if, if, if you'd like to, come up here right now. Come up. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Like... Good. Yeah, yeah do, come up. <laughs> If anyone else would like to come up, you can use the stairs if you want. How about this one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the hand lens. If you're hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you you just have to take the rock. You can either lick it, or if if you want the really safe option. The stereotype is that Some it's only men who will do these yeah. risky kinds of yeah. public and events. You can, if you're squeamish, you go like this. Yeah. Yeah, and, and have a look. So does it look better? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, same okay, as water, so, too. Same as water. Yes, yeah. yes, same as water, that, that. OK, now you have the question. This is the, the, uh, the classic one. You, you, you actually have to lick this one, I'm afraid. Right. And say what it is. OK. Say what it is. Now, it's, clear, it's a clear, colorless mineral. Uh, it could be quartz, it could be calcite, it could be gypsum. You know, it could be diamond uh, of that. So uh, lick it and tell us what it is. It's really salty. It's rock salt indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got that word. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I really wanted to, to check in. Are, right. are geologists OK? <laughs> are, you, are you OK? <laughs> like, uh, uh, every alternate Thursday, we're okay. No, no, yes. no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our final speaker won an Ig Nobel Prize about roughly nine years ago. Uh, she and her team looked at the question of uh, you're, you're familiar with people being. Um, divided into two groups, more or less, according to the way they seem to be built. Some people wake up early in the morning, um, early birds, they're called, and some people seem to come to life more late at night, night owls. And uh, she and her colleagues tried to look at the question, is there some relationship between being one or the other and being psychopathic? <laughs> but that's not mostly what she will talk to you about today. Today, she'll talk about a very different project she has done, which has not been discussed very much in public yet. And I will let her give you all the details of it. Please welcome Mina Lyons. Thank you, Mark. Is, is my microphone on? Can everybody hear me? Excellent. So as Mark said earlier, um, these are Research, pieces of research that normally make, make people laugh. And my studies don't make me laugh at all. So when Mark asked me to come to give this talk, I was like, what? OK, well, here we are. Uh, I'd like to ask if there's anybody in the audience who is a football referee. Do we have any referees in the audience? Or do we have any foot, uh, football players? No foot, oh, there's football player. Do we have any football fans? Excellent. So, because I have a bit of a confession to make. Uh, I know nothing about football at all. So I even went to buy a referee top uh, for this occasion. And my husband told me yesterday that it's actually not even a referee top. <laughs> so, hello, I'm just waving at my husband, Mel, in Liverpool. He's watching this through the live stream. So I'm still wearing the top. Um, never mind. So. Uh, <laughs> So, what this is about, of course, is male-male competition. It's male-male competition for status, for resources, and status and resources come with mating opportunities, which is the material for evolution. And no, no, I'm not claiming 
that the referee here giving a yellow card to Peter Crouch is doing it because he wants to impress the ladies in the audience. <laughs> but it's more about subconscious uh, processes that our ancestors had that made them more sensitive to the context of competition, um, taking into consideration their own position um, in the hierarchy and their own height. So this is what this uh, research is about. So, does size matter? It appears to be so. In um, hundreds of different species of animals, a larger size has been related to um, better advantage in competition. Uh, it's been related to things like higher, um, higher status in the hierarchy, more mating opportunities, and this um, happens whether you're a gorilla or, um, or, or a, a seal or even in humans. So in our species, um, it has been shown that height is an advantage, especially in men. Height advantage has been demonstrated in uh, the workplace. Uh, taller men tend to have uh, better job, jobs. They earn about 600 um, dollars more per year per inch. So it's almost like positively correlated with the, um, with the earnings as well. And um, also taller men uh, tend to be more aggressive in, uh, in um, com competitions, in kind of like a contact sports. And um, they just seem to be doing a little bit better than, than uh, those individuals who are a little bit shorter. So it appears to be that height is an advantage. And also women find taller men a little bit more attractive. So they tend to be doing better uh, on advertising their uh, dating willingness on Tinder, for example. Of course, people can lie about it, but you know, if, if the uh, taller men do the Tinder, they don't necessarily lie. So, but why do we then have this variation in height? So it's not just that taller is better because we have got this fantastic uh, variation uh, between individuals in humans and also in other species. So my example poster uh, boy species here are orangutans. Orangutans have got two different types of males. They have the traditional large males with the fatty cheeks uh, here on the left-hand side, but then here on the right-hand side, is a male that looks more like a female. So these males are much uh, smaller and they don't have the typical uh, male characteristics. And while these big males fight with each other for the access to females, these smaller males go and actually copulate with the females. <laughs> so they are not using aggression on competition, but they are using a little bit their brains in how to overcome the risk of uh, injury, for example, in male-to-male -male encounters, and how to, how to um, find mating success in a little bit different way. So how does this translate to... Oh, now I know why I actually took this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about the bananas before I came here today, and I thought that I'd better take these cards just in case, and they actually <laughs> came in handy. So um, there was a study a few years ago that looked at height advantage in the tropical rainforest. So actually, men and people <laughs> who are uh, shorter are much better in navigating in a tropical rainforest. So that's one of the advantages of, of not being so tall. And also, uh, while they do the navigation <laughs> in the tropical rainforest, they might be a little bit less likely to be uh, bitten by mosquitoes. So that's another advantage of being shorter. And also, a recent study found that men who are shorter also uh, tend to be more narcissistic and they are not happy with their height. So uh, I actually don't like this uh, Napoleon complex or short man complex or tall man complex uh, terminology because I don't think height should be uh, something that's pathological. But anyway, uh, what people have shown in previous studies is that narcissism is something that relates to strive for status.
And also, um, narcissism is, um, in some contexts, attractive in males, at least in short-term mating contexts. Um, that's what, like, when women have been uh, evaluating narciss narcissism and narcissistic men's characteristics, they sometimes like them in short-term mating contexts. So it could be that actually height is something that is, is beneficial, shorter height in mating contexts too. So now we get to our study. So how on earth did we decide to look at um, football referee height and uh, decision making. So the idea was that maybe decision making in referees is something that's almost um, indirect competition. So it's not direct male-male fighting, but it's something that um, referees could be using as a subconscious mechanism for punishing others. And in laboratory studies, it has been found that shorter men are more likely to punish their opponent by holding money and not sharing it. Uh, so we, we had some kind of um, previous research that would back up the assumption that maybe shorter referees in football leagues are more likely to be uh, punished taller players, because it's an indirect form of male-male competition. So, we had uh, four professional English football leagues from uh, 2017, 2018, and um, we had the statistics because one of our researchers is a referee, so he had access to all of the stats. And then the football referees emailed or WhatsApped their height to us. So then we had the information on their height, and also the statistics uh, that FIFA kindly uh, gave to us on the, on the uh, penalties and red cards and yellow cards and fouls. And th this is like 10 pages of results. And this is what I've got. I haven't even got a graph because it didn't come out nicely in this slide. So basically, uh, first finding was that there was a correlation uh, between um, the red cards and penalties awarded by referees in the lower leagues. So this indicates that shorter referees were more punitive. But then, what does it mean? So, I'd like your help in saying which one is, could it be of these? Is it because shorter referees could be more punitive because taller players commit more fouls? Shorter referees are more vigilant, or shorter referees want to display their authority. They are overcompensating. Put your hand up if, it, if you think it's the first one. <laughs> put, your, put your hand up if you think it's the second one. Put your hand up if you think it's the third one. <laughs> Red card. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Bananas. You. <laughs> if you have a question, please raise your hand. And if I don't like your question, I might show you a red card. Uh, hi. So you said that for the lower leagues, there was a correlation between red cards and penalties. Was this also true for the higher leagues, for the Premier League and the Championship, or only the lower leagues? No. But, so but before you answer. Would you mind standing up so we can see how tall oh, you are? Oh, actually. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, actually, so we, we didn't um, control for the height of the players, so that's the next thing to do, because, of course, it's, it's kind of like an um, interaction between those people, so we only did a correlation between the penalties, uh, fouls, red cards, and yellow cards, and the height. So it's obviously more complex than that. So these are really crude uh, initial findings, and we should do exactly what you mentioned, like look at the player's height as well. Any other tall people, taller than me, <laughs> wanting to ask questions? <laughs> I think everybody's taller than me, so it's easy. Uh, did you control for the sex of the referees? or did you only take male referees? 
So in this study, we only had uh, male referees. So I think that would be interesting as well. So would uh, male players uh, be, or would female referees have same kind of um, decision making behind their uh, penalties and red cards as the uh, male referees? That would be the next interesting question to ask. And next study, maybe. And the final question. Uh, hi, um, you said you got the referees to self-report their height. What level of confidence do you have <laughs> in the accuracy? Yeah, those pesky referees. So I would imagine that if the referees are self-reporting the height, it's probably the shorter referees who would be exaggerating if going by the earlier study that found narcissism and height are being correlated. So narcissistic individuals also are exaggerating. So maybe it's actually that the uh, shorter referees are actually shorter than what they reported. So I think we have to have our uh, measuring tapes probably next and go and actually measure the height of the referees. Because it's, um, it's information that is not publicly available, so it was just based on their own self-assessment. So there could be a bit of a, I don't know, exaggeration, especially in the shorter referees. Good. Thank you, Mina Lyons. Thank you. And, and stay here. Stay here. Oh. Uh, Akira, could you come up? And Lloyd, would you mind helping with the microphone? And then I'd like to ask all of the winners who spoke, could you please come up on stage? After we get the microphone sorted, this back that you see here belongs to Lloyd James, who arranged pretty much everything that happened tonight. You can see even when he's facing in another direction, he's still making everything work out just perfectly. Okay. All the winners, if you'd come and stand at center stage. Uh, bananas, if you wouldn't mind joining. Okay. And um, in a moment, Akira will have the final word. But before that, Lloyd is going to tell us about what's coming next. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, just some brief procedural directions. If you're hanging around for Barfest, uh, that is at 5 o'clock. Uh, we will aspire to open the doors about half an hour before that. Um, we will ask everyone to leave in the interim. Um, obviously, you're welcome to explore the, the wonderful local area. Um, if you have registered for the author panel that's happening during the intermission and you have to have pre-registered for that, uh, that is upstairs, so simply get into the foyer. Uh, ideally take the stairs because the lifts will be quite busy, but you can take the lifts if you need to. Up to level five, um, find the Reed Lecture Theatre, which is well signposted, and uh, that, that's, that's where you're going. Um, we will also have uh, books for sale from the authors that are involved in that uh, panel event and who are also um, Get signing books <laughs> later. Uh, that will be in the room uh, on the same level as this uh, across the foyer. Um, and <laughs> um, I think that's it. Um, <laughs> the, the book signing will start in, uh, the panel event will start in about 10 minutes, so there's no rush to get upstairs. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Just before Akira O'Connor has the final word, I want to thank all of you very much for coming. This is the first time we've done this kind of public event since the pandemic arrived. And I, I, speaking for myself, it's a great pleasure to be able to do this and to see all of you and to have all of you here. Thank you. We're hoping to do more in the spring, to going back to having a regular Euro tour, which we used to do. If you know of any institution that might want to host an event like this, please have them get in touch with me. And now the final word will belong to all of us, led by Akira O'Connor. But before I do the final word, I would also like to thank Mark and all of the organizers of, uh, of this event. So thank you very much.
So, we'll now engage in a bit of citizen science, so we'll do an experiment. And I was told that I needed to manage ex expectations, so this is an experiment that is not going to be boring. <laughs> Uh, what I would like you to do is to uh, pay close attention to me. I will give you signals when I need you to do something different. Uh, but until you see otherwise, I would like you to repeat with me the word v. <laughs> v. 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 The, 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 Thank you all. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>